I'm going to begin today in the same way as in previous webinars by challenging the audience with the question that we ask our customers and our clients. And that is, what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory? And how do you monitor for it? As scientists, we've all had that experience where we've run an assay and you've observed unexpected results. And this demonstrates the importance of including positive and negative controls in the design of your molecular assay. And this allows you to assess whether the performance you observe is within those expected parameters. So this question is key in the motivation of Horizon Diagnostics to develop reference material that will help to allow standardized and um, allow us to standardize these assays with the use of independent external controls. So assay failures occur far more frequently than we should be happy with. And these results are shown from a proficiency testing scheme, EMQM and is resulting from 18 EGFR samples that have been sent out to 100 different laboratories. And the graph here presents the genotyping errors that, that were found. Now, in the wild type, you can see that up to 20% of, of the reads were incorrect. And this is as a result of false positives. And even more concerning is the G719S results, where 35% read either incorrect mutations or, or were false negatives. Now, while these schemes do not yet cover next generation sequencing, which is what we'll focus on today, these results are just, uh, just to put into perspective the question in the previous slide and to drive the message home about the need to monitor assay failure in your laboratory. So one of the areas that we at Horizon are actively focusing on is next generation sequencing. And one of the main reasons that this technique is becoming so increasingly popular and attractive in clinical diagnostics is that it allows you to take that one tumor sample, carry out your assay, and then have a full picture and characterize it for an array of different genotypes in one go. And this is um, a massive improvement from even a few years ago, in which you would have to prioritize the genes that you were going to look at, and then uh, analyze your data, and see if you needed to carry out subsequent tests. Now, as with any molecular assay, there are multiple steps that need to be performed. And I'm just going to walk you through this workflow. With next generation sequencing, you begin with your tumor sample, extract the DNA, and carry out quantification. Prepare your library for sequencing, and then the bioinformatics analysis is what allows you to determine the action to be taken. So as with any assay, each stage within the workflow, uh, variability can creep in. So the fixation, storage, and uh, the formal and intensity for those for those samples that you have can affect the DNA extraction. And this is something that Alessandro will focus on in the next stage of the webinar. This can affect your quantification and affect the amplifiability of the DNA in the library preparation. And essentially end up with artifacts that, that may be present within, within your data. While one gold standard reference would be attractive to cover all stage of the workflow and accounting for all sources of variability. What we've done at Horizon Diagnostics is to produce a panel of reference standards, um, which are designed to cover different stages of the workflow and to answer individual questions. So at this stage, I just want to mention that Horizon Diagnostics reference materials are all research use only, um, and they should be used in the appropriate manner in your laboratory. So the main focus for today's webinar is going to be on the bioinformatics step of the NGS workflow. And while the analysis itself can introduce a level of variability, the, co the contribution from the other stages in the workflow can culminate into artifacts in the data. And so what Alessandro will describe in more detail is the effects of formalin on your analysis, and also the role well-characterized reference standards can play in optimizing your workflow. So just a brief introduction. Um, the researcher can use the on-machine anal analysis software or one that they've developed themselves to suit their assay. And they may vary in, in, in different parameters. So this may be alignment stringency, which is how closely the sequence must match the reference. 
or the threshold of coverage. You know, it may have to reach full-time coverage before it, it's called. Um, and for these parameters, it's important to evaluate how those changes can affect the final data output. So an example of the immense influence that the informatics software can play um, on the resulting data is demonstrated by this, this Venn diagram here, which was compiled by the Genome in a Bottle Consortium. So the same data here was analyzed with three different pipelines. And there was significant variability in, in the resulting calls, with 80% being shared by all of the pipelines. Now, this doesn't mean that one each of those pipelines are, you know, are, are the truth, or, or they're right, or they're wrong. And what we should be aiming for is to try and provide a, a, a so-called known sequence. So that may be by the use of a well-characterized reference standard, in that you know the allelic frequency, it's been sequenced numbers of times. Um, and having it as a reference sequence to, to what data um, you, you actually achieve. So I'm now going to hand over to Alessandro. Uh, he's our bioinformatician at Horizon, and he's leading the development of Horizon's resources for next generation sequencing technology. Hi, I'm Alessandro. I'm a bioinformatician uh, specializing in next generation sequencing applications. And I recently joined Horizon Diagnostics to make the most of the data coming from our unique uh, cell editing, genome editing technologies. Uh, as an introduction, uh, I would like to stress my enthusiasm for the potential uh, bioinformatics has today to improve the quality of healthcare. In the last four decades, gen uh, sequencing technology improved enormously, and uh, uh, it really took off uh, thanks to uh, 454 technology just 15 years ago. And uh, in, the, in the last few years, the introduction of third-generation technologies like PacBio or Oxford Nanopore is already promising to take the whole sequencing market to the next step. What this means to healthcare is, uh, is simply, between commas, unprecedented access to our biological blueprint. We never had uh, such a wealth of biological information. And there is a number of challenges, of course, that we have to face to make the most of this opportunity. Uh, in, uh, in the last uh, eight years, as you can see, uh, the, the cost of genome sequencing started dropping drastically. The introduction of machines like the Illumina HiSeq drastically increase the throughput of uh, sequencers. And, um, and, the, and the new technologies, of course, uh, they are following this example. But despite uh, uh, this wealth of data, uh, there are problems that need, still need to be solved. While accessing genomic information is not a problem anymore, uh, processing, analyzing, visualizing this information still remains a big challenge. There, there will be a lot to say uh, regarding these challenges, but for today's webinar, we'll be focusing on data creation, which means, because of course, uh, to acquire informative sequencing data, the first thing we need to get is high quality biological samples. And today we are looking at formalin fix paraffin embedded uh, samples. And uh, FFP derived samples uh, have been uh, very popular and still represent uh, a huge source of uh, material for generating next generation sequencing data sets. In the last few years, uh, at the, all the main applications of NGS have benefited from FFP-derived uh, samples. Uh, there have been papers uh, publishing targeted resequencing from FFP samples. Uh, epigenomics applications like ChIP-seq chip or reduced representation bisulfite sequencing also have been uh, reported using FFP-derived samples. And also uh, high-throughput transcriptomics benefited from uh, this methodology, including RNA-seq, but also uh, sequencing of microRNAs. However, 
uh, the situation is not uh, entirely optimistic. There is a number of problems, known problems. We need to counteract uh, protein DNA in the covalent interactions occurring during the fixation process. There are known problems regarding DNA degrada degradation, and this tends to lead to a lower DNA yield and to the extraction of smaller DNA fragments. Here you have an example in the bottom right from a recent publication. Here, the co here we are comparing the insert site distributions uh, for samples derived from FFPE and fresh frozen tissue. And as you can see, the FFPE derived samples tend to display a, a shorter insert uh, size. What does, it mean? what does this mean for your NGS dataset? Well, in the worst possible case, uh, uh, your NGS dataset won't uh, be a real problem because if the degradation is, uh, gets far enough, you won't get any NGS library out of your FFP tissue. In uh, milder cases, you might still get uh, smaller fragments and to get some sequencing data out of it. But the quality of the sequencing data is something that needs to be determined. And for the clinical market, it needs to be determined quantitatively as much as possible. In a, in a paper from 2009, uh, the Schweizer group reported a direct comparison of FFPE and fresh frozen tissue using Illumina short read sequencing. Some of their observations included that storage time for FFP samples didn't seem to have a, uh, really an impact on the divergence of the results from fresh frozen tissues. However, FFP derived uh, data sets did display lower mappability of the reads, which means that uh, short reads had uh, a, a lower fraction of the Illumina short reads uh, found their way on uh, the gene human genome. And then uh, the resulted downstream analysis included a higher number of mutations, but in this larger uh, number of mutations, there was also a lower fraction of known uh, SNPs and small indels. And this sounds already suspicious enough. We are probably looking at artifacts. However, a very recent paper showed, again, good correlation between FFP and fresh frozen uh, derived uh, samples. Here you can see a uh, comparison FFP on top and fresh frozen at the bottom for copy number uh, variant along the entire uh, genome. And the, so the results seem to be uh, comparable. However, another recent paper uh, argue that uh, uh, actually storage time does affect uh, the quality of the data set that can be obtained by FFP uh, fixation. Uh, they this very work confirmed the high fragmentation and the loss of uh, nucleic acids you can expect. And this translates to a lower library complexity you're going to have a higher uh, number of identical reads in your data set. Uh, in this comparison, they found an average of 30% of duplicated reads for the fresh frozen tissue and up to 85% redundant reads for FFP-derived um, samples. You can see in the top right that uh, on the x-axis you have the years of storage for the FFP-derived uh, for, for the samples, and you can see that the intersection um, of the variant called for, from the two methodologies drastically decreases as storage time increases. On the biochemical side, uh, C2U deamination is a known cause, and other papers displayed uh, a notable pattern of C2, where most, uh, uh, most novel mutations were actually transitioned T2C and A to G. What does this mean for your analysis? These uh, uh, presumed artifacts uh, result in a lower fraction of uh, mapped reads, uh, and uh, also they, could, they can lead to an increase in partial or gap mappings. 
Here, this is a very simplified cartoon showing you in the top left a case where uh, your genomic region has uh, five reads uh, correctly aligning on it. We are looking at one base, C. Now, in the case of when we introduce artifacts from these reads, in, uh, in uh, the, the most basic case, we introduce a new artifact variant. But uh, as our analysis gets more complex, uh, the accumulation of these artifacts can lead to lost mappings, especially if these uh, uh, artifacts accumulate in the middle of the reads, or in the best case, to partial mappings where reads align up to a certain point. And uh, we don't, don't, don't only have to worry about SNPs, but uh, to today, a longer read lengths and, uh, mean uh, better possibilities for predicting a copy number variant, uh, translocations, the arrangements, and large indels. And this analysis, which benefit, for example, from paired and reads, uh, uh, suffer from the introduction of these artifacts. Because, for example, artifacts could uh, mean that one of the two maids of a two pair read will not be mapping correctly, suggesting to our algorithm that an insertion or deletion occurred in that region and will, we will be accumulating support for larger rearrangements because of the artifacts uh, drastically decreasing the possibility of getting anything biologically significant out of our analysis. And it is fundamental that we have a way of uh, measuring uh, how reliable our FFP-derived data sets are. So, in conclusion, uh, recent works suggested that FF, the quality of FFP-derived NGS data sets can decrease according to storage time. Artifacts detract, uh, make you lose data, you lose statistical power in a variant calling analysis, and you can compromise more, even more complex analysis, for example, for structural variant, and adopting molecular reference standards in your pipeline can greatly help you filter out these artifacts. Yes. So in, in, the, in this part, I'm going to talk more about our uh, uh, focus on genome in a bottle reference standards. As you might know, the genome in a bottle consortium has been generated to provide the scientific community uh, with um, a highly characterized uh, genome. <laughs> there is actually a number of genomes which uh, are being worked on by the consortium. Stakeholders include both academic and, uh, uh, in, and um, uh, partners from industry. And today we're already assisting at uh, uh, international collaborations with the different, uh, the different uh, co collaborators uh, uh, working on sequencing and analyzing the genomes provided by the consortiums. Um, uh, today we will talk uh, in particular uh, about the, the trio uh, of Ashkenazim uh, uh, genomes, a son, father, and mother. In this slide we are providing the correct identifiers uh, both from uh, from us, from the CORIL website, from the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and from the Personal Genome Project. Horizon Agnostics provides molecular reference standards for all three uh, members of the trio. So if you are interested in performing variant calling analysis, and if you want uh, uh, to measure the reliability of uh, your pipeline, uh, this can help immensely. And as I mentioned, a number of, um, a number of uh, data sets have already been made available. Uh, one of the more, most interesting is uh, a variant calling analysis uh, derived from the intersection of at least two technologies. Uh, for this, co uh, co for this uh, uh, analysis, three technologies have been used. First, complete genomics with its own proprietary pipeline, then uh, Illumina base space pipeline including BWA uh, and the older version of GAPK, and this uses uh, short uh, periods from HiSIC, and then uh, uh, for a more recent technology, 
uh, Thermo Fisher light -like technologies, Ion Torrent, uh, um, Exxon technology has been has been used. A read where uh, aligned and variants were called using again their own uh, pipeline. The complete genomics data set in particular includes a number of different uh, uh, reports. You can find small variants, SNPs and small indels, copy number variants, structural variants and a mobile element insertion, insertions such as transposons. Uh, the NIST uh, has already on its website uh, all this data ready for uh, download. Uh, it's open for analysis from uh, the public. You can find, as, uh, the, as I mentioned, the Illumina high-seq data uh, with its analysis made through BaseBase. There is also some uh, mapped reads using uh, make per Illumina reads with a 6 kilobasis insert. Uh, something very nice, you can find longer PEC bio reads as raw data. Uh, PEC bio software is uh, available for you to try if you have the inclination to, to do so, and I highly recommend having fun with it. And also there is the ion torrent data sets available, uh, some uh, very interesting uh, optical mapping data from bio nanotechnologies, and finally some synthetic long reads from Illumina's molecular technology have been uploaded for son and father, and the mother's molecular data set should soon uh, follow. So there's actually quite a bit to uh, play with. Um, uh, focusing on the Ashkenazim trio, on our website we wanted to, uh, uh, to work on uh, one of the most popular uh, analysis pipelines. So we picked uh, the Illumina uh, uh, variant calling analysis. Uh, there are two runs available for each member of the trio, and for each run, in general, that you will find uh, on our website uh, all uh, four reports from the consortium. One BCF file, variant calling format file, with SNPs and small indels. These small indels tend to be in the low double digits. A, a distinct file with a prediction of large structural variant, large insertions, large deletions, and rearrangements. A distinct file for copy number variant predictions. And uh, more interestingly, a genomic BCF where you will find SNPs and small indels from the first file plus all uh, bases, with all positions in the genome which are homozygous for the reference and are supported by the data. As you can see, there's quite a number of files, and we additionally provided the coverage uh, feature tracks for the UCSC uh, genome browser as bed files. To make things easier to, to browse, we are also providing a merged version of all these files, which means that we'll find one merged file for all SNPs and small indels from the trio and the same for structural variants, copy number variants, and also one for the genomic BCF. This is not a simple concatenation, but uh, uh, identical reads have been properly merged, which means that uh, whereas the trio has a total of 34,000, 34 million uh, reads, a uh, small, small variant, the merged version has 8.4 million unique variant for you to look at. And, and uh, similarly for large structural variants, um, um, we go from 84,000 uh, uh, variants to 53,000 unique. Okay, for copy number variants, uh, from 2,000 to 1,000. And uh, these again are uh, unique uh, records with genotype information telling you exactly which uh, uh, sequencing run for which uh, member he has which genotype. And uh, uh, to further help you in exploring this uh, interesting data set, uh, we are providing a report uh, uh, as a simple Excel file. There are two things to consider here. First, uh, as a bonus, we provided uh, a new annotation using uh, popular uh, open source tools like SNPF and SNPSIFT. 
Uh, these tools, among other things, provide annotation from a number of uh, databases using uh, the integrated database DB and SFP. You will find uh, for this, in this Excel file the COSMIC uh, uh, NDB SNP annotations, which were already present in the uh, Illumina uh, VCF files, plus uh, information about amino acid change, codon change, uh, annotations from the NCBI CleanVar database for clinical significance, uh, pred predictive scores like the SIFT score for the probability of a damaging variant and evolutionary conservation scores such as the one from Prescott's. And for a subset of non-synonymous uh, uh, variants present in the 1000 genomes uh, phase one data set, you will also find allele numbers and allele frequencies allowing you to compare allele frequencies uh, between Ashkenazi and trio variants and 1,000 genomes. For um, something to consider is that one variant can have uh, different effects. Uh, the tool we use, NIPEF, uh, predicts a high, moderate, uh, low, or modifier effects for each variant. In our report, we are providing uh, all effects for large structural variants and all effects for copy number. A variant. However, because the 8.4 million SNPs would have a, a trouble finding their way in Excel sheet, we filter variants uh, uh, with high or moderate impact. These include, for example, missense variants, uh, internal stop codons, and so on. And these have uh, the greatest uh, potential to be interesting for uh, people looking at clinical significance. Uh, so another thing we added is uh, we specified where a variant uh, had, had actually more than one predicted alternative allele. These mixed variants are present, but you should take any related score with a pinch of salt. They are present, but not really supported. And um, in total, you will find for SNPs and small indels 73,000 records which correspond to 73,000 effects of high or moderate impact, and these correspond to 32,000 uh, unique variants for you to look at. And this information is available on our website for you to download. And just to make you an example of how to use this report, one of our scientists used it just to look at uh, variants shared between uh, uh, across the trio. And so here you can uh, try giving a look at the somatic and germline uh, effect, uh, differences uh, in, for, for the shared uh, mutations. For example, here we are looking at 352 variants which are only present in, in the sun. And uh, again, you will find this online and there's a lot to play with. So just as a conclusion, uh, again, uh, using molecular reference standards uh, uh, is really invaluable if you want to validate your variant colleague analysis pipeline and if you want to attach any clinical significance to your results. And uh, we already provide molecular reference standards for the well-characterized Ashkenazim trio, so this is an excellent starting point. And, uh, if you want to test your pipeline with other technologies, the consortium is already providing most second and third generation sequencing technologies. On our website, you will find a report with additional annotations, and you will be able to uh, use directly something as basic as Excel to mine the most relevant Ashkenazim trio mutations. And uh, again, everything is available on our website, and I think uh, I will leave you with Joe. Thank you very much, Alessandro. As, as he did say, uh, we do have a wealth of data on our website, and I would encourage everyone to um, go onto our website after this webinar. Um, and also, we do have our live chat, which both uh, Danielle and uh, Natalie uh, monitor on a regular basis. And with that, I'll pass you over to Danny. So what I'm going to do just to wrap it up now is to cover some of the really common questions that, that we get in. Um, 
on via the live chat and our, and our technical support line. So this is a very common initial question that we have from a lot of our new customers um, in that they would like to validate their NGS workflow, but they want to know the application of the different QC products. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we've developed at Horizon a panel of reference standards that are designed in order to answer those individual questions and can be used at different stages of the workflow. So I'm going to begin with the gene-specific multiplex. Um, with, this, with this product, the, there's several mutations present within a single gene. So we've used KRAS and EGFR. Um, and because they're from the same single parental cell line, what that means is that you can use the, the equivalent wild type to dilute down uh, those mutations and to determine your limit of detection. So they, they're on the scale of sample features to sample complexity. So those are at, at the beginning of the scale. And if you want to look more in depth into that limit of detection and to, to determine the specificity of it, you can use the true qDNA samples, which cover 40 engineered mutations. Um, and this, they're fixed at 5%, 2.5%, and 1% allelic frequency. And using them together, you can determine the level at which the specific mutations drop out and can compare this across a number of the different variants and also across the gene. And this um, product covers a number of oncorelevant genes that are commonly assessed in many of the targeted gene panels. Another use for this uh, true Q range is that by providing you with four blends of, of 10 different variants, they can be used as a rotational reference standard. This is something that's referred to in the recommendations for um, reference material um, by the New York State Guidelines. So one of our most popular products is the quantitative multiplex. And the beauty of this is that it's the same reference standard, but in multiple formats. And this allows you to test it at different stages in the workflow and answer different questions. So with the GDNA, you can slot that into the quantification or, or the library preparation stage. And with the FFPE, it allows you to monitor that variable pre-analytical stage of the DNA extraction. With the formula compromise, this is a format as part of our early access program that allows you to, to interrogate whether there's an effective formula on your assay. So the genome and abortion samples that Alessandro provided a lot of details about in his previous slide um, are also available as an FFP format. And this provides you with a reference standard to cover the entire workflow with the pre-analytical stage. And also at that bioinformatics stage where you've got a, a sample that has been widely sequenced. The last one is the structural multiplex DNA reference standard. And this was introduced uh, this month uh, as part of the early access. And, and this has SNPs and indels, but more importantly, it contains those larger changes, so the structural variants, the translocations, and the copy number variants, which are difficult to sequence. This one I'm going to focus on in a couple of slides' time. So the main, the main point I want to bring out here is that with the rapid adoption of NGS as a standard technique in the molecular pathology labs, it's important to make sure that we're providing the reference standards that you, that you guys want and, and in particular format. I'm going to move on to another common question, which is that people would like to assess the effects of formalin uh, on their assay. And this slide is just to look at the impact of formalin treatment on the DNA. Now, the tumor samples can be varying in quality. Um, the formalin treatment can introduce fragmentation, cross-linking, and methylation, which Alessandro uh, explained. And this can affect the DNA yield and the quantification which then in itself affects the amplifiability in the library preparation stage and also the sequencing results. The formula compromised DNA reference standards as part of our early access program, come as a, we have them as a pair. So you have a mildly formula um, intense, intensity sample that you can compare to a severely compromised sample. Now these have got characterized fragmentation levels and we've quantified them uh, with the qubit assay, as I mentioned in one of in the, in the question and answer session earlier. Um, and by using them together, you, you can really establish where the formalin is having that particular um, st a strong effect on um, in, in the quantitative multiplex uh, genotype. So the last question I'm going to focus on today is that 
it, we're, one we're getting asked more and more, and that's that they, people would like to assess their bioinformatics pipeline and look at the detection of the single nucleotide variant, structural variants, and copy number variation. So the structural multiplex covers 16 genotypes, and with this they have SNPs, um, small indels, and long indels, fusion pro, uh, fusions with the RET and the ROS translocation, and copy number variation. And with this product, we've got fixed allelic frequencies around the 5% mark, and this really allows you to interrogate the context of the mutation. What I mean by context is whether you've got a SNP in a high GC region and a SNP in a low GC region. But can you still measure that 5% variant calling, or is there a problem in bias of the amplification, um, or because of uh, potential chemical modifications? So I'm going to wrap it up there, coming back to the initial question that we asked in that what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory and how do you monitor for it? Now these questions below are, you know, are what you should be asking you know, maybe yourselves about your assay, what extraction and quantification methods are you using? Are you using the nanodrop? You know, should you be using a fluorescence-based method to make sure that that quantification is really accurate? And what is the limit of detection of your workflow? Do you know the threshold that you are aiming for? And as NGS techniques um, become more and more adopted and developed, you know, that limit of detection is going to become even lower. And is, is the impact of formalin treatment interesting to you? 